Okay, welcome to this webinar, The Nordic Way, Innovative Financing of Green Projects, organized by the Stavanger Region European Office and Eurocities, together with European Project Partners. My name is Runa Monsta, and I'm the director of the Stavanger Region European Office. We are located in Brussels, and our offices is representing the Stavanger Region which is a region located at the southwest coast of Norway and is known to be the Norwegian energy capital. With oil and gas, offshore, hydroelectric power, wind power and other renewable energies. Although the region has so much more to offer, the region offers possibilities in agriculture, tourism, culture, spectacular nature, robot buses, chargeable lampposts, innovative buildings, and so much more. So stay tuned to learn more. The Stavanger Region European Office has 26 members from the private and the public sector, as well as from the academia. Today, we are very pleased to have with us three of our members as mentor and one of our member as a moderator, representing the triple helix of our member base to share some of their success stories regarding innovative financing with you some information about the housekeeping rules and the program today. Feel free to use the chat to comment or ask questions to the speakers. Remember to select two all panelists and attendees. We also encourage you to raise your hand and ask the questions directly to the speakers after they have finished their presentations. Thank you in advance for being active participants. Also, many thanks to my talented colleagues, Edel and Tora, who have done a great effort in organizing this event and for their technical assistance today. Please note that this session will be recorded and please let us know in the chat if you don't want Eurocities to have your contact details, which is just for product reporting purposes that Bernadette will come back to later. You will receive the slides later in a follow-up email. In this webinar, we will learn more about how Norwegian actors from the energy and broadcasting company Lisa, the non-profit organization Nordic Edge and the municipality of Gjestal have used innovative financing to finance their green and smart city projects. The learning outcome is expected to be how innovative financing is carried out and what are the key success factors used in the Nordic for this type of projects. We aim to shed light on the barriers and opportunities by different innovative financing schemes, how to find and develop cross-sectoral partnership, among other things. The first speaker at this webinar today is Bernadette de Grendele. Bernadette is an expert in innovation with particular focus on the public sector, digital technologies and smart cities. In the last 15 years, she worked in international advisory roles at national and local levels. She also worked for the European Commission and the OECD. She has been a project coordinator at Eurocities since 2016 and has worked on large smart city green projects. She's also leading the facilitation and replication activities from the Eurocities perspective in the Horizon 2020 Prospect project. Eurocities, where Bernadette works, is a network of major European cities where Stavanger is a member. They bring together cities for knowledge sharing and policy development at EU level. With Bernadette, we have a long history of working together and our offices in Brussels are located a few hundred meters apart. She's been very active in promoting the Nordic Edge and she's also been a speaker at the last year conference as a previous chair of the European Innovation Partnership on Smart Cities and Communities, Action Cluster on Business Models, Financing and Procurement. At this year's Nordic Edge Expo Brussels Studio, organized by the Stavanger Region European Office, the Secretary General at the Eurocities, Annalisa Boni, was also one of our keynote speakers. Today, Bernadette will introduce the EU project prospect and she will, will be sharing with us her expert's opinion about innovative financing. 
She will be followed by our moderator, Mr. Runa Dahlfitcher. Runa is the Pro-Rector for Innovation and Society at the University of Stavanger and Professor of Innovation Studies at the same university's business school, Center for Innovation Research. In addition, he coordinates the EU Horizon 20 Innovative Training Network on the role of university in innovation and regional development. With that, I ask you to give the full attention to Bernadette. The platform is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Runa, for the nice introduction. Um, I would just like to first uh, tell you a short story how we uh, started about this webinar. The idea was that uh, we would like to have really the Nordic uh, countries also presenting how they do innovative uh, projects, uh, especially on energy efficiency, smart cities. And I had a long history of working with Stavanger, so it was obvious to reach out to them. And I'm very, very pleased that they have uh, brought together such a nice uh, webinar today with uh, so excellent speakers. About Prospect, uh, so the project that uh, offered space for um, for this uh, webinar, uh, what you need to know is focusing on uh, capacity building primarily and for innovative financing, uh, as, you, as you heard already, for energy efficiency projects. So how to translate this uh, for you? If you have signed up the Covenant of Mayors, if you work for cities, municipalities, regions, you probably know that uh, you are preparing action plans and you then have uh, projects to, to finance them. Um, and I mean, you have projects and you need to finance them. Often we talk about funds, so everybody knows what funds are, uh, what subsidies are, but uh, innovative financing is in its word uh, innovation, also something that is new, that is the non-traditional way. So we are not talking about subsidies, but we talk about sometimes a mix of subsidies, funds and financing. So financing can be also things like crowdfunding, innovative financing or cooperatives, or if you are familiar with uh, green bonds or revolving, fund, revolving uh, funds, or um, also public-private partnerships, anything that comes in a non-traditional way also can be linked to local uh, banks or uh, just the way of contracting also how you collaborate with, uh, with the private sector. So it's very, very broad. And today the speakers will also highlight uh, many interesting projects they, they have uh, developed um, on this field. I would also like to add that often these uh, projects, of course they focus on energy e efficiency or smart cities, so can be about uh, buildings, mobility or uh, lighting or combination of different things. And that's actually very often the case that also the digital aspect, the data management comes into play. So a lot of technological development and innovation in that sense is uh, uh, playing an important role here. I would like to ask uh, for my presentation so that So I will talk about uh, financing climate actions and uh, yeah, the next slide please <laughs> and about uh, prospects. So the next slide, um, it's about peer to peer. So it's really uh, focusing on cities or smaller muni municipalities and regions. The aim is really to support uh, we call them local regional authorities altogether to implement projects which are linked to their climate action plans. So we call them, uh, it's a terminology we use, uh, SECOPs. Uh, at local level, we often see that uh, public investment funds, as I was mentioning, not enough or even not appropriate. Sometimes uh, it's better to do certain things with private investment or it's better to create sustainable business models or scaling up, for instance, of something that has been already implemented. So we definitely need to talk about innovative financing schemes. Next slide, please. So innovative financing schemes, uh, if you heard of uh, the Covenant of Mayors, they have developed a very useful guide on this. So I will not go into details, but we really talk about the part, the last column, which is about alternative financing schemes. 
And uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's often funding from other private sources. So for instance, private sectors or investors or uh, non-financial institutions can be also financial institutions, can be third party financing. So this is debt financing sometimes, or we can have also investors or ESCOs, um, energy service companies, as we call them. Uh, sometimes um, what we heard in prospect from other municipalities that it was very, very interesting that um, this type of uh, third party financing can be also not just financially interesting, but also from the technical and knowledge point of view and expertise that they can bring on board this way for the maintenance interesting. And then soft loans, which can um, also of like loans that are below market rates and longer payback periods. You all know if you work in this field that uh, energy efficiency projects or climate projects are very important and they are they need like a long-term vision it doesn't happen in uh, one or two days so this type of uh, loans are specific to those but these are just examples you can read more in uh, the covenant of many uh, guidebook about these uh, financing schemes next slide please so what we talk about is uh, in prospect is peer to peer. So most of your uh, speakers today have worked with municipalities in projects or uh, they themselves work or they are even politicians in municipalities. So they will be very familiar with what kind of commitments they are making in terms of uh, signing the covenant mayors, uh, submitting action plans. And many of them uh, are struggling actually with uh, finding ways to fund this type of project and have the right financing. So this project was uh, meant to help really the capacity building or, and knowledge sharing on uh, this subject. Next slide, please. How many people have we attracted? So it was a three years uh, project. I say in the past because it soon ends. So this is one of our uh, events where we can already share about uh, a lot uh, of experience. So we had uh, 195 participants from cities, regions, energy agencies. And um, we had 46 learning groups. So you can see that five on private buildings, 15 on public buildings for transport, 18 on public lighting and four, four cross-sectoral. Cross-sectoral is also about renewables. And we talked about 18 type of financing schemes. So this is a, a short summary of, of course, the different type of financing schemes which were brought on uh, into play or to, into discussion. And we have uh, uh, 36 good practices, which are shared, shared on the website, which I will come to at the end of the presentation. So this is a, a little bit of a summary of a three years uh, project in, uh, in one image, which uh, you can uh, read later on and get back to me if you have questions and you would like to know more about uh, what we have done exactly. Uh, next slide, please. What uh, the purpose of today is from, um, from Eurocity's perspective and from a project perspective is that we talk about needs. So we started in 2017, actually I was writing the project proposal or I was in the team together with other partners, but from Eurocity's. And uh, we knew that we need capacity building. We didn't know that we needed so much <laughs> as it has been reported by uh, the authorities who say that basically 40% that they really lack capacity. And um, most cases, it's also the admin administrative capacity for managing these projects is uh, missing. So good practices, sharing this type of uh, good practices are really, really impactful way of helping each other. So peer-to-peer -peer trainings, uh, also matchmaking with investors and this kind of workshops or webinars that we organize today are really important. And that's what we got confirmed also in 2020. So it's something that is a long-term project, I would say in itself. And next slide, please. But how about the financial needs? Um, so we see that some of the uh, cities uh, or regions have uh, specific um, budgets, but they often need higher budgets to meet the climate targets. Um, quite high percentage uh, reported that they don't have a dedicated budget even for implementing their SECOPs. 
So there is a high risk that there will be no budget unless we talk about innovative financing or different ways and not just funds. Of course, funds are very important, as I said at the beginning, but there has to be uh, other ways as well. And the exploitation in those cases where we have uh, had budgets uh, located is excellent. So it means that if there is a budget uh, allocated, then cities really know what to do or municipalities they know what to do with this budget and many of them are also credit worthy we have looked at different countries and uh, there were very few examples where um, they had really debt serious debt issue cities most of the case uh, this is not the major obstacle next slide please next slide please oh, yes <laughs> so um i think i had one more slide before no just uh make sure uh, yes so about the legal needs um, I would just like to highlight that um, legal needs are also very important because they are specific regulations that can help innovative projects or uh, can be obstacles for instance in public procurement we see that uh, national uh, EU regional levels can create an obstacles if uh, they don't focus on the energy efficiency projects uh, in a different way than the traditional procurement rules. So this is also important to talk about. I'm also having a lot of expertise in this. So if you want to know more, you can contact me later. But I wanted to highlight that this is uh, very important. And of course, because we today will talk a lot about the collaboration with the private sector in Stavanger itself, as uh, Runa was presenting at the beginning, is a good example how they are organized and how they work together between the different, uh, amongst the different stakeholders. So this is uh, something that came up in our discussions as well as a very important factor and it's something to learn for many uh, cities and municipalities and regions. So next slide, uh, please. What uh, you have as materials already from the project is uh, like handbooks. So these handbooks um, have uh, the structure of the modules I presented at the beginning. So lighting, uh, buildings, uh, private and public separately, transport and cross-sectoral. So you can check them on the website of um, H2020 Prospect. Uh, the next one, next slide please. And um, you can find a lot of good practices uh, already on our website of H2020 Prospect. And I would like to invite you to visit um, these good practices if you have any specific interest. The next slide, please. I would like to uh, thank you. And I would like also to mention that uh, I'm currently working on replication booklets uh, for the project. So on the same website, soon you will find for each of the modules um, a summary of what the participants, so the 195 participants, found important in terms of uh, replicating uh, the solutions that, uh, that have been uh, presented in the project or the different projects. So thank you very much. I will give the floor now to the next speaker. Rune, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bernadette. So this was a very useful uh, introduction uh, to the topic that we will uh, talk about today and uh, a good overview of the, of the background. Uh, we will take you now over to uh, talk about how we have worked uh, on these uh, issues uh, in, uh, in the Savannah region and we'll present uh, three different cases uh, from our region of uh, different projects that have used innovative financing. Uh, and uh, we will start with uh, the company of uh, Lisa. Uh, so Lisa, uh, for those who don't know it, it's uh, an industrial group located uh, in the region, uh, which focuses on renewable energy production, uh, which was its, its core activity, uh, producing hydropower, uh, six terawatt hours per year, and then distributing energy, uh, but uh, for a long time now also being a broadband service provider of uh, fiber to the home services with uh, around 650,000 homes connected. Uh, they deliver services like uh, TV, video on demand, internet access, telephone, and also uh, energy services. Uh, lately, they have introduced carrier services uh, in the north of Europe and Internet of Things networks and services. So they have a broad scope of activities. Uh, we will hear from uh, Dag van Vorge, who is the Head of Innovation. Uh, the Research uh, and Development and Innovation Department focused on the early phases of development of the products for Lisa. So uh, Dag van joined Lisa in 2006. Uh, he has two master's degrees, uh, one uh, I'm proud to say from the University of Stavanger, 
uh, and uh, another uh, from uh, BI Norwegian Business School. He has worked in Lisa first as a chief product officer, then as a chief innovation officer for its uh, subsidiary Altibox. Uh, and he is now, uh, since 2012, the head of innovation for the Lisa Group. Uh, he has a, a profound interest in the field of new digital business models and has recently published a book called uh, Creating Disruptive Ecosystems. Uh, so he has uh, a broad and interesting background uh, to talk about this. Uh, so Dagfin will present uh, two projects uh, that uh, Lisa are, are working on. So please, uh, Dagfin. Välkommen till Klimabyen. På här sker det fryktligt mycket för tiden. Jag är er sjukt förnöjd med den. Han är er grön när han är er ledig och så är er han blå när när du laddar. Det är er de tre första och flera kommer. Nu är er det ny teknologi som gör att vi får tvåvägs kommunikation med lyktastolparna och vi kan ha ström på 24 timmar i dygnet. Då var detta en av de ting som vi såg man kunde bruka lyktastolp i infrastruktur till. Vi har elbilsalg och en revolution på elbilar. Då måste vi oss tänka nytt på infrastrukturen och detta är er ett exempel på akkurat det. Folk går från fossilbil till elbil när infrastrukturen blir lätt tillgänglig ute i gatorna. Väldigt stas när ministern kom och kastade glans över detta projekt det är er ju väldigt stas och korps så det är er lite mycket tänker jag ärlighet kan tro nog mor och far ser detta här på TV både Lyse och Stavanger tänker nytt och har en betydning långt utöver akkurat dessa punkter för det är er det andra oss kan lära Okay. Uh, what you saw here was actually a small video from a project that we run here for uh, in 2018-2019, uh, and it addresses the challenge of uh, citizens that actually acquire an uh, electrical vehicle, and they live in a dense city area and. They're, they don't have their own private space or garage where they actually can charge the car. So we saw some news articles uh, describing how these cables were hanging out of windows, crossing pavements, which was a hazard for, for other people. And it's, it's not legal either. So this was the challenge that we tried to address. And uh, the person you saw on the video is one of my employees. He's called Tron, um, very innovative guy. And um, it shows actually how how you actually can solve this challenge by exploiting the existing light pole infrastructure in the city. Um, and this is a challenge that a city will meet when the number of EVs are increasing fast. Uh, the partners in this project was uh, the municipality of Stavanger, um, but also Stavanger parking because charging and parking is really intervene very closely so you have to address both at the same time uh, so also 
with payment of parking and charging. We, uh, we work together with Easy Park for this effort. When it comes down to financing, um, it's been the Norwegian Ministry of Environmental and Climate, which has, actually has a, they have a funding pool, which is called in Norwegian Klimasats. Uh, so, and we as a private company cannot uh, apply for this, but uh, the Stavanger municipality could. So we work together with them. Uh, and the funding that was, uh, we received here was around 65,000 euro. Uh, was used to actually acquire the equipment, build it, and install these chargers. And uh, we have them in three places in the city of Stavanger. Um, and it's, it's, they also require that there is a 50% uh, in-kind contribution from both the municipality and Lisa as a, as a company. Uh, and when it comes to the results of the project, uh, what we have seen is that it's, uh, it's been used on a daily basis. All these charges are being used uh, because we have a meter inside each of them so we can actually measure how much they charge. Um, and, and they also have to pay for this, but they combine payment of parking and, and charging in one. So to make it easy both for the users and ourselves. So the proof of the pudding lies in the eating, and this is also true for this project. So the best evidence at least that we have here is that it's being used, and we also get some attention from neighboring cities that they want to look at the same kind of solutions. Yeah, and this, this kind of project we call Blue Ocean because it's never been done before, at least not for, by us. So it's a lot of uncertainties, uh, and, and this is also important when you when you start a project, you need external funding actually to take this risk because there is a substantial risk for these kind of projects. Yeah. So maybe we should show the next movie for the, or maybe we should have questions and answers. Is that right? Yes. So uh, thank you, Dr. We can uh, open the floor for uh, questions if anybody has some, uh, some questions uh, for uh, this project. And uh, while we wait, I mean, I, I can start uh, a little bit the discussion. So. I mean, this, this is something that seems kind of like an, an obvious idea in a way. Uh, why not use the electricity that we have already there? But uh, how did you come up with this? So what's uh, kind of uh, uh, the background for somebody coming up with this idea? No, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, it's Tron's idea. And it, the background of it was actually, as I mentioned, the, the newspaper articles, because this is a challenge for, for, uh, for people, because if you are blind or don't have much sight, eyesight, having these cables over payments is not allowed, but people still do it because how could they charge it otherwise? So it's actually a, it's, it's a problem uh, and a challenge that needs uh, to be solved. So he started out thinking about if this could actually be done. And uh, the first, uh, when we work on new ideas, we usually create a, a prototype first. And our prototype was actually showcased at the Nordic, Nordic Edge Expo conference in 2018, uh, but it had been put into use. So the next natural step for us is always to have what we call an MVP pilot, a minimal, minimum viable product pilot, where we try to install it in real life and, and, and see how it actually works. Uh, and there is no decision whether we should do this on a commercial basis or a larger rollout before we actually harvest from experiences from this pilot. And that's what it's been doing here. Yeah. Uh, so we have now a, uh, a question in, in the chat from uh, Maya Anderson. So uh, if you want, you can turn on your, your camera and, and ask this question. So I mean I, I can I can also ask it. Uh, so so one question uh, that, that comes here in, in the chat uh, is: uh, Will this project be expanded to other parts uh, of the city? Uh, yeah, we are discussing this. It's it's of course up to the municipality to decide. It's not our decision to take. But as of now, uh, this kind of um, light pole charger has been installed three different places. One was that you saw here on the video which is a mixed area between shops and public buildings and, and residential buildings. 
we have another one installation which is in the typical residential parts uh, of the city uh, where, the, where you don't find any shops but there are a lot of people who live there and they also have the same challenge and the third installation is on the on the on the key actually down by the sea uh, which is uh, available for public parking so it's already in three places but if it's going to be expanded it's up to actually the municipality i know there has been some discussions but it's not decided yet i mean i, I suppose this is an uncontroversial project in a way i mean it's hard to see the downside and, and it should be a way of actually making any parking lot uh, electric uh, because uh, you always have a lamp post there but so what, what are the challenges of implementing this well, well the challenge is is it's, it's two threefold i would say uh, the first one is uh, that sometimes you have very old infrastructure in the city center uh, sometimes it's new and then you don't have to do many changes but if it's very old you might have to exchange the the light pole which is there already it's not a huge cost, but it needs to be done. Um, there is also a challenge with, with signage, actually, uh, the traffic signs. And that was nothing we thought about in the beginning of the project, but after they had installed this, they need to put up signs. And the first version there was really chaotic. There were like 12 or 15 new signs in this short road, which the inhabitants were complaining about. So. Thinking about where you place it uh, is actually quite important to, to avoid a lot of like visual noise in, in a sense in, in the city. So because you need to follow the rules of science for, for, for the users. Thank you. So we have also a question from Bernadette. So if you want, you can also turn on your video and, and ask the question. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. So my question was, um, because you mentioned that 50% of the financing had to come from the municipality and LISA together, if I understood it correctly. Yeah. Was this uh, easy to arrange? Is this happening often uh, that you work together with the municipality in this way? Mm, what is your experience there? Yeah, it's actually, it's for us, it's quite common, especially when we work in the, in the IoT, uh, business and a smart city domain because then you really need to work very closely with the people who actually owns the challenges uh, so like going to the um, uh, no offense food but going to the mayor is not where we start we always start at the lowest level because they know actually where the challenges are the real challenges uh, in, in in running a municipality practical challenges that they have so this is how we do it and uh, our department has the freedom of actually also put in in kind hours and efforts in these projects because if if we can solve a challenge for one municipality it's usually also a, a business potential there and we don't know but it, it's usually there and if you can solve one challenge for one municipality you can solve it for many others as well so you have a scalability and re replication kind of potential as well Thank you. Uh, I think we can move on then to uh, the second uh, project that you want to present, which is called the Blink. So we have another uh, video I think coming here.
Yeah. This is the second project that I want to present. Uh, it's called the Blink. Um, and uh, it's actually an open innovation project that has been going on for quite some time. Um, but uh, when it comes to, if I'm, uh, if I'm starting with, uh, with the financing part here, it's, um, it's, an, uh, it's a way of supporting businesses. It's called business networks, actually, uh, if you translate it directly from Norwegian to English. Uh, and, uh, and the whole um, purpose of this uh, financing is that they want collaborating, collaborating companies to succeed in the market with a new product, which is, hasn't been launched yet. So, uh, and they also give a funding of 50%. So we applied for this because we are four companies. It's called, uh, it's Lisa. It's a company called OMT Tech. Uh, on scene and West Control, and they're all Norwegian uh, SMBs, the other ones. Uh, so we, we applied for this because we work together to develop this uh, solution, as you saw on the video. Um, and also we had some, uh, some luck in a way. Sometimes you need luck in innovation. Uh, it's not uh, only skills. Um, because uh, a large uh, municipal municipality came out with a tender uh, because they had a challenge today, uh, and this was mainly because of COVID-19. Uh, and this tender came out in March and uh, April uh, this year, uh, and they were asking for a very cognitive friendly video solution, uh, which can be applied in many different user use contexts. So that was their, uh, their somehow their tender. So, and then we just have got the financing uh, for this project. So we have, um, if you look at video platforms today, it's usually what we call general video platforms like uh, FaceTime or Skype or Teams for that matter or Zoom. Uh, and they are great for collaboration, uh, but you cannot change much in them. They're not very adaptable in a way to, to, to a special context. So what we had developed uh, in this project was actually a video platform, which is uh, adaptable to special needs. So in the period from uh, late April until June, we actually adapted the solution we had to come up with what you saw in, in the video. Uh, it's a very easy to use uh, video solution. There are only like two buttons on it. It's like the green and the red one. Uh, if you want to receive the call, or if you want to deny it, um, the installation is very easy. You just plug it in the, in the power outlet, and it's actually up and running. Uh, and it's um, and it's also easy to use for the health personnel. So this solution was supposed to address health. Per it should be used between health personnel and the patients, but also have an option to include their next of kin due to isolation issues, especially in the COVID nineteen situation. So. In less than two months, we actually had our first service up and running, uh, and we won the tender. Uh, we, it was actually in a sharp competition with other companies, um, and when and then we came into a dialogue with the municipality because the tender was not like very sharp. It, they just said that we want this kind of functionality. So during after we had developed it and delivered it, as you saw here, it was like the auto call uh, function so that the user did, didn't have to do anything to receive the call. But the municipality didn't want that solution. They said that no, uh, due to privacy, we cannot allow that. So you have to change that part. Uh, we want some kind of a auto log off function. So if it's not being used in five minutes on the health personnel's uh, devices, it should be automatically logged out of the service. And uh, so there were several wishes that they wanted to have. And also on the management system, they wanted more layers. We had two layers, uh, but they wanted like municipality, uh, the city district, and the group beneath. So three levels. So we could adapt that because we control the, the video core and, and the solution itself. So that's actually a short um, description of this. Um, and again, the financing part was uh, from the business networks uh, um, possibility that we have in Norwegian Norway. Uh, yeah, and uh, again, coming back to how it's being used, uh, we started out with five devices and, and then they extended it to, 
to 10 users and now it's 25. So hopefully it's, it seems that, that it works fine for them for now. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ben. So uh, we will uh, open up also for question uh, for, for this project. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I can, I can start a little bit. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, COVID. So do you find that uh, uh, the COVID crisis has uh, opened for new uh, or more uh, innovative financing options? Oh yeah, uh, not only for us. Uh, it's it's uh, if you look at uh, the the rollout of Teams solution and Zoom solutions and other solutions, you see that uh, video companies are really flourishing due to this uh, unfortunate pandemic. But uh, we see that there is a strong need here, uh, and in, for especially for the municipalities, they really seek solutions that are very easy to use and easy to deploy and easy to manage. So the municipality themselves now can take a unit and they can dedicate it to another user if they want to. So they can manage it in a fairly easy way themselves. Um, so yeah, it's uh, for the video business in the worldwide, it's uh, the times are good. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I mean, what are your needs for innovative financing when you move on, when you try to scale up this project? So is, is this a project that uh, has a business case that will kind of stand on its own uh, two feet or, or will you need uh, different kind of financing options also in, in the continuing uh, process? It's a good question. Uh, we had actually an, an application uh, in, uh, in EU, which is in a program called um, uh, active and assisted living AAL uh, where we had a collaboration between uh, the city of Sabadell in Spain and Eindhoven in, in Netherlands uh, so we were very close uh, actually to, to send it in but uh, they had a little too little time in, in, in Eindhoven uh, to actually they had a board meeting after our deadline so they couldn't actually give the, uh, the green light uh, and in these projects you need at least two other like user partners uh, so so we are actually seeking financing but uh, I think probably the most important part here since we actually are now almost in the market uh, uh, we need the external financing investors actually to see if this can fly because this will be what we call a spin out the con it will not be a part of uh, Lisa uh, as, a, as a Lisa video or something it will be spun out of this company along with the other three partners so we will only own a part of this company if it succeeds though it's still it's still a job to be done mm. yeah thank you so uh, we have a question also from bernadette so please you can uh, turn on your video and ask the question So uh, my question is, what would you say as a key success factor for such projects to be financed and what helped you most? Uh, I know it's difficult probably to answer in one word, but uh, if you can pick something that really, really helped you, can be relevant for others. Well, when we applied for this funding, it, it was uh, quite a, it was a long process in, in a sense, because it's, they want to know a lot about your plans and your, your if you think, how are we going to make business out of this? Because we are not the municipality, we are a company. So, so we have to be commercial in the way we answer. So and, and in particular for this kind of uh, support uh, system that they had in, in this uh, business network uh, part, they focus a lot on, on how you do this. And um, so you have to have numbers and you have to have plans, even though you haven't done it yet, you still need to think about it and present what your thoughts are, how, to, how you can scale actually. So this is a, probably the largest challenge for us in, in the application process. Uh, and once uh, we had done it and they had some more additional questions to us and we had answered them, they, they, um, they said it was good. So, so then we got the funding, uh, which is uh, the whole project um, was around one, 0.4 million Norwegian kroner, which is around 135,000 euros. And we get uh, half of that in support to, to do this. And I, I feel, really think we, we, we hit the target of this program because um, it's all about getting something which is mature, immature out in the market. So we were really lucky to get this tender coming along because then we had really 
we had we had really to force ourselves to to think about sales and marketing and everything actually from the projects that we had so it was um, it was a good exercise for us at least mm. and did you did the municipality help you in uh, this process or what no. would you expect from no. the municipality not in terms of uh, business model of course but in terms of collaboration because a lot of cities and municipalities are listening today so they may need to know what what to do in order to yeah. have such a great project <laughs> yeah what well, they didn't help us at all when it comes to the to 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 writing um, the answer for the tender but it was a real help to us to focus on the really important things when they came out with the tender. So we had it, we could read it, and all the other competitors read it. So then we had to try to translate the tender needs into a solution that we could build. So, so that we are very grateful for the tender and for the municipality coming out at that time, because it was, as I said, there, it was lucky that it came out just after we had received the, the, the funding, or, for, for to, to work together to pro, to get this project out in the market, so it it was a gift for us in a way. But during the process of writing the tender, there was there was a closed doors. There was no help or anything, so we didn't know if we would succeed. But luckily, we did. And once we had won the tender, we got more information and more details how they wanted this to be. Uh, so, and in that sense, it was helpful because now the product that we now have, we know that it. It's quite, it's quite useful for municipalities uh, and their usage in a way, yeah. So I think you answered the, the, they need to give you a, a very good detailed uh, tender in order to, I mean, there was a luck element, <laughs> but mm. that not everybody can replicate, I would say, but uh, I think that they need to have a good uh, tender that they uh, carefully plan. So mm. companies actually can offer uh, right solutions. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Uh, the hardest part actually with the tender was, uh, was the whole system of admitting or sending in the proposal. It was so bureaucratic and so difficult, even for us who are used to this. So uh, for small startups, this is really a hurdle and, 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 and a challenge actually. So, but luckily we, got, we came through that as well. Hmm. I, can, I can imagine. And, and do you think this is also difficult or different uh, in, in the health field than in the infrastructure field that was the yeah. first project? Yeah, um, I think so. The system we use is called Marcel. Uh, I don't know if it's like all the municipalities use it, but at least it's used in the healthcare sector. And it's just logging in there and uh, finding your way around is, is actually quite uh, challenging, at least for us who was new into it. So, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Dijkvin. So, uh, two very interesting cases there. And uh, we will now uh, move on. Uh, to hear from a different kind of organization, uh, Nordic Edge, uh, which uh, uh, is a, a non-profit and uh, a, a cluster organization. Uh, and we will hear about uh, another field again, uh, which is energy efficient buildings, uh, which uh, is an increasingly important topic both in Norway and in the EU, uh, both as part of the, the Green Deal and, and uh, more broadly, uh, the question of, uh, of sustainability. So investment and financing of energy efficient buildings is something that's increasingly important. And uh, we are happy to have with us the CEO of Nordic Edge, uh, Steve Binnesan, uh, who uh, started at the cluster in uh, June of 2018 and became the CEO of the organization uh, in February 2019. Uh, he has previously been a project manager in the project finance division of, of Skagenfond, which is a an investment company uh, and he's also worked in Agro Solutions, which is an, an energy company. So he has a, a broad background and he will uh, talk to us a little bit about Nordic Edge and a lot about uh, their project uh, in Oasis. So uh, please, uh, Steve. Around the globe, technology is transforming the way we live. It's changing how we work, commute and shop, how we educate our children and take care of our family's health and how our cities are developing. Today, smart city products and services constitute a trillion dollar market. 
with competence and technology being transferred from traditional industries into new business opportunities. To embrace this opportunity, Nordic Edge is bridging the public sector with academia and private companies, where software as a service meets autonomy and the built environment, delivering solutions to the shared challenges our cities face, strengthening Norway's position in this fast-growing market and increasing our export possibilities. With its history of transformation and being the cradle of Norway's high-tech oil and gas industry, our host city Stavanger is uniquely positioned to take the lead in delivering more sustainable, citizen-centered solutions for a smarter, more resilient future. The Nordic values of trust and collaboration create innovation and change, enabling the Nordic Edge ecosystem to accelerate the transformation of traditional industries into green, sustainable businesses and opportunities. We do this through growth programs, by piloting and implementing cross-sectoral projects, providing platforms at global events in Asia and the US, and by hosting the leading meeting place for smart city decision makers, Nordic Edge Expo and Conference. Our new innovation center in Oasis helps startups to transform and propel their ideas from concept to the international market providing a dynamic arena for transformation built on collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rune. Um, well, you just saw a small glimpse of uh, who we are and, and what we do. Um, but today I'll, I'll focus and, of course, talk about one of the larger collaboration, collaboration projects, and that is in Oasis. Uh, as I hopefully will show you, we truly are a collaboration between uh, the private and the public sector. Actually, I will claim it is a collaboration that also includes academia, finance, and to a certain degree, also the public. So it is a quadruple helix initiative, actually. Uh, if you will start the presentation, uh, it You can also go to the next slide, please. The Stavanger region, as you see it here, is on, has on one hand a great, exciting, growing companies, startups, and initiatives. They all have their needs in order to grow and develop. On the other hand, our region has uh, one of the most, uh, uh, we claim that the region have most of the pieces in that puzzle, uh, although some of them are easy accessible and some of them are less known. For this and probably other reasons, we saw that companies and ideas moves out of the region uh, and was not always finding the match or the growth media that they needed. Some therefore oriented themselves towards other parts of the country and even abroad. Uh, we also knew that uh, the need for a focused networking arena would be highly valued uh, just, uh, just in our sector, but also in the sectors that has great competence in the region already. Uh, the Oasis ID, in its simplest form, was actually not to compete with initiatives out there, but to fill the gaps and mo mostly coordinate what we already have. Uh, I think that's part of the success. It was, uh, it was a quite uh, humble and uh, not an intrusive sort of approach, uh, and, and that was made us probably a very easy project to, to work with for others already out there. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, on the right side here on the picture, you might even see a gray pointed building that is actually uh, in Oasis once it's ready next year. Um, but, but for now, we, we couldn't wait and the project had this really strong drive. So we are located more or less in the center of this picture now with several of the, of the products and the ideas of Oasis already up and running. Um, one of the owners of Nordic Edge, uh, Smevig, bought some time ago this, this building on the, on the right side. And after a, a really open, and, and I would use the word friendly process amongst uh, us and, and our owners, we ended up that that project, project location would be optimal and green for this initiative. So this 4,000 square meter rebuild uh, is, is gonna be the, the solution for the physical location of, of Inoasis. Uh, 
already back then in the start, it was also amended that the partners, uh, that uh, amongst the partners that any other project or organization could, could join this initiative as long as they brought real value to the project. It was also agreed that Nordic Edge uh, should have the opportunity to benefit financially if this was a success. Um, we are part of, for instance, uh, the, the cluster program in Norway and, and having to, of course, see and seek different ways of, of building business cases also after this support from Innovation Norway and the Research Council uh, and so on are, are, so are, are used. If you can go to the next slide. Three of our owners, Smevik, Lyse, and Sparobank and SA Bank, agreed that if the Stavanger municipality and two international companies, being Microsoft and Tieto Evry, uh, would join the initiative on equal terms, they would all co finance the project for the first three years. There were some, of course, discussions whether it was uh, the right companies included and whether a three year horizon was short or long enough. Uh, but that was the start of it. Uh, I dare to say that the approval from Stavanger municipality via their Nannings fund was the decisive part. That was what made this uh, house of cards, so to say, to, to, to work and, and was, the, was the beginning. Next slide. Also along the way, we had a good dialogue with the University of Stavanger and even other research institutes. Uh, because knowing that their presence and support would, uh, would come in handy when we're going to sell this ID to other participants. And, and that certainly has helped this project significantly. Um, the University of Stavanger now has somewhere around 10 uh, PhD degrees linked to the smart city and having close interaction with most of them adds value and adds value in the, in the views of the companies in the cluster. Next slide, please. We defined the focus areas together with our smart city cluster members and ended up filling in oases with service and program activities along three lines. First was capital, where we do anything from investor preps to just smart city investor days, etc. Uh, on the innovation product development side, we do collaboration with like all existing accelerator, accelerator programs that we sort of work on, work with from local initiatives like Grunderhub and It's a Growth to, to initiate big international ones with Microsoft for startups. That last one really attracted a huge crowd just before the, the pandemic hit us. Uh, so we're really looking forward to, to continue that path later. That tells me that this, uh, this initiative was, was needed and, and valued in the region. Uh, third but not least, uh, competence across sectors. We do science forums, problem pitches, and, and different hackathons. You can go to the next slide. Uh, the top three floors of the building will have meeting rooms, permanent working stations, and maybe most importantly for, for me right now, hot desking. Uh, we believe that having a, a full floor for good hot desking, COVID-19 uh, safe, or as we would say, we would use the, 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 the valuable lessons taught for the last six months or so, I think we will have a, have a valuable uh, environment there for, for big and small companies to, to come and go as they would like. Uh, also having, having hot desking enables us to overbook and, and that again will reduce the price for, for of course small companies that don't have the finance to, to pay a market price in either this part of the, of the region or close to the city center and so on. Next slide, please. On the first floor, however, however, we are now in the exciting process of deciding which labs uh, gets the allocated for floor space. It's a really difficult task, and we try to weight uh, current needs and future opportunities. Uh, and of course, also we need to focus on commercial aspects. Uh, rental income and active use of these labs will be uh, success criteria, and they're also part of the business case for Nordic Edge. Uh, but again, uh, the same partners that finance this project has uh, put development opportunities and, and needs and ideas into this. So we already know that some uh, traffic and attractive life, so to say, in that floor is, is secured. 
And, uh, and that again, of course, attracts other interesting companies and partners. You can take the last slide. Uh, we think we have sort of made an ID that is much bigger than a building. We think that we have started a project that can be moved out of the city, out of the region to different parts of Northern, uh, Norway and the Nordics. Uh, however, we need to have a landing place and that building is, is that place from where we will sort of operate. Uh, we are confident that uh, this will be both a digital and a physical innovation center. Uh, and I think it will lives up to the goals for coordinating the solutions of the region. Uh, we also have the tools uh, that we can take out, as I mentioned, and the interest so far for this project in C exceeds all our expectations. We even now have in dialogue with new actors uh, that uh, have shown real interest in becoming additional main partners. So I, I claim that this is a good example of the Nordic way of innovative uh, financing of green projects. Thank you. Over to you, Runa. Thank you, Stig. Uh, so uh, we are open for question also uh, for, uh, for this project. Uh, so I could start uh, a little bit. Uh, you mentioned a couple of, uh, of partners that you, uh, you used in this uh, project. So uh, some of the big local companies, but also uh, companies like Microsoft and, and Tieto Every. So how did you identify these partners or why did you want uh, in particular those companies to be involved? I think we sort of looked into four, four groups. We, we, of course, it's easy to start with our owners. We are a nonprofit organization, but still our owners really put an effort into, I think, in supporting our, our work and work quite closely with us. Uh, so first thing is our owners. The second one is we have partners that are not owners, but still are really close to us, municipalities, for instance. Uh, thirdly, it would be cluster members. We have uh, large and small cluster members that has been with us for the last three, four years as well. But the fourth is maybe the most important one here. I'm, I'm not sure of a really good word for it, but I would say our network's network if you know what I mean. We, we tend to see and find who, who is our partners working closely with and can they add value to, to the ideas that we are sort of focusing on. And that was what happened, I think, both with Tieto and Microsoft in the, in the early days. And, and that's why we managed to, to uh, get their attention and get them on board on this. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, is it, I mean, are there ways of financing this kind of project? Is there anything that's kind of, you have this idea and then uh, I suppose it's something that's not really tailor-made for existing funding schemes. No, by no means. Uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity of, of sort of building this house of cards. Uh, on one hand, our, our owners already put a lot of effort into it, but having uh, having this uh, this uh, co-financing with the with the municipalities and other uh, really made it possible i think everyone then felt sort of safe and split the risk amongst them and 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 uh, and therefore it was possible also just as much as as money there and then was the need for for to to put uh, real projects into this really actions we need to have have life to this project we needed to know that we had work to do from day one so to say and and that was part of the success here we 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 all the moment we agreed on terms we we started receiving work almost too early so that's that's why we are up and running on a on a certain level even now before we have moved into the to the building itself I mean, as, as a cluster organization, I suppose you need to find uh, financing for everything that you do from some kind of source. So uh, how do you go about uh, looking for financing for different kind of projects that you do? And is it often this kind of innovative uh, ways of financing things? Um, I guess it's both. We, we have, of course, the usual suspects uh, and, and we, we, we learn a little bit every time we, we sort of interact with them. But on, on a, if I'm going to sort of on a high level, I would say that we tend to get invited into consortium and joining partners, maybe in a, in a small part for the first time, but then we, we build some knowledge, we get some relations with, with the, the different um, organizations, and maybe next time we will, we will be in lead and be a coordinator for some of these applications. 
And when I'm looking back now, I see that some of the big ones that we now are, are uh, in lead of maybe started out as us being in a really small part, just being invited into a consortium and, and thereby sort of building trust. And when this is up and running, uh, so is there a business model? Is it something that will kind of be self-sustained once you have uh, filled this uh, building with uh, activity? Yeah, that's really important for us. Uh, I think I mentioned in my presentation that there will be one day when our our um, support from the from the public sector, no, from the from Innovation Norway and the Research Council and and so on is is done. And, and on the first meeting for the clusters in Norway, they always have a have focus on a continued strategy. And this is certainly a part of our continued strategy. Uh, it's important to find uh, good sources of income with limited risk. And we are not gonna be experts on, on housing or, or that part of it. So again, we, we are lucky that some of, of the partners in this project have that expertise. But, but we see this, if done properly, as, as one of the ways to, to securing also some income for the, for the years to come. Uh, and, and that is one of the big focuses right now. So we have to take that in mind for some of the allocation of floor spaces, et cetera. Try and find what is commercial, commercial right, basically. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Stig. It was a very uh, interesting uh, project, I think. Uh, we will move on now uh, to, so we've heard from uh, a company, we've heard from a nonprofit, and now we'll also heard, hear from a, a public sector organization, uh, a municipality, uh, which is the municipality of, of Yestal. Uh, and uh, they have profiled themselves as one of the smart cities uh, of uh, 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 of this region uh, and uh, will uh, show us a little bit their uh, project which is a Horizon 2020 project called Fabulous and we have actually the mayor uh, of Yestal with us today uh, for the Fjelspe. He has nine years of experience as a politician both at the municipal and at the county level. He's been seven years now the mayor, uh, two years a deputy mayor and he is also the chairman of the board of the Stavanger Region European office. Uh, so he has uh, a lot of uh, experience also in dealing with uh, European uh, projects. Uh, he is especially interested in the smart strategy and smart practice of the municipality and has a background in social anthropology. So uh, please, uh, Fode. Uh, thank you, Rune. Um, I'm pleased to meet you guys. Thank you for the presentation. Introduction. Um, yes, I'm the mayor of a fairly small municipality, the municipality of Yestal, uh, placed, as you probably know, on the southwestern part of Norway. I think I have been invited to this uh, webinar uh, due to the fact that we as a small municipality has been able to take part in uh, a project like this uh, fabulous, which is autonomous driving, robot cars driving in several European cities and uh, towns with a budget, total budget of 7.3 million euros. Uh, let me please uh, show uh, to you uh, the first picture from my presentation, just to... Um, uh, to explain to you how we try to become a smart city or a smart municipality. What we see now is a picture of a very um, interesting and, well, I would say a successful uh, a new planned city or town center of Olgor. This was a dull uh, part of Olgor. Uh, and we wanted to cre create a new town or village center with friendly and inviting environment, uh, both for uh, children and youngsters and well, all the citizens uh, of, uh, of Yestal. Uh, and you, this is, uh, the picture is taking a summer day in June, 2019 and proves we uh, achieve what we wanted to do uh, to, to get people to spend time in the center 
uh, uh, enjoying themselves. But at the same time, we uh, wanted to take um, or to do something when it came to mobility, because parts of, of our uh, um, town centre um, doesn't have a good transport solution. Um, so we um, wanted, yeah, as I say, what you will show in a minute, uh, the fabulous um, um, robot cars driving around in Olgor. Uh, the way we got into this was that we, as a municipality, wanted to take part in, uh, yeah, European cooperation. Uh, participated in workshops both in Norway and in Brussels, explaining to other possible partners, yeah, the size of, of Yestar, our aspirations, our goals, and uh, what we were interested in. And we were sort of picked up by other uh, international European partners wanting to do something when it came to uh, when it came to robot cars. So please show us the video that has been made of, of uh, Gertrude and Gerard driving around in the municipality of Yestal. This is a marvellous opportunity for uh, a small town or a village like Olgor and a municipality like Gestal to, yeah, to be part of the, the transforming modern world. So we are really keen on being part of this uh, pilot. Autonomous driving is an important part of the future. So it's very interesting and nice for the municipality of Yestal to be, well, some kind of living laboratory where we can test out this particular pilot. I'm pretty sure that both at Yestal in Helsinki, Helmon, Tallinn and uh, Lamia, and of course in London and Berlin as well, we will see autonomous cars like this, because this is a part of the future. I believe that all citizens uh, uh, at Olgo could benefit from this, but particularly the elderly, because uh, Olgo is a, is a hilly area so this gives people the opportunity to take that bus the last mile home. Yeah, you saw uh, an enthusi enthusiastic mayor explaining uh, what these uh, autonomous cars can, can do for us in the future. I think uh, the concept here is to transport people the last mile home. We have uh, been doing this together with um, several other municipalities, Tallinn, Helmon, Lamia, Porto, Helsinki, and of course you you know Yestal. Uh, we have had the main procurer has been uh, Forum Virium in Helsinki, which is, I think, has been um, well a key um, part of the success. Uh, a really a competent uh, um, lead procurer. Um, you saw the vehicles named Gertrude and uh, Gerard um, in traffic, 
uh, starting in the town center of Olgor. Um, people have welcomed this. My grandchildren told me this summer, the next time we go to the city center, we will get ice cream and slush and go with the robot cars. Explaining to you this has been fun for people. Uh, this was a part, uh, was um, something I've learned is called pre-commercial procurement, uh, where we sort of, well, we ask for technology or products or solutions not quite being there, uh, not existing. So uh, when you see other innovative ways of procuring, um, uh, perhaps they, they procure or ask for products that are there or close to being there. This is, a fair, this is part of, of a way of procuring or asking for something on a fairly um, early level of development. Uh, I will be happy to, to, to uh, answer some questions. I, I don't want to go really hard into details here, but, but let me uh, focus on, on some, uh, well, some important insights. Um, I think this way of pre-commercial procurement can be a fruitful and interesting way to challenge research uh, institutes and developmental uh, companies. Well, yeah, to, 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 to go uh, the extra mile and, and develop new technology needed in the modern world. Um, for us, an important insight is that even a small municipality like Yastal can take part in, an, in a process, in a project this innovative, this big. Uh, so the motto is uh, small but smart. International cooperation is or can be uh, a way to educate uh, an organization. Let's say a municipality like uh, Yestal and a way to educate, um, yeah, on staff on an individual level. It is very important to have one lead procurer. Uh, Yestal could not have been the lead uh, in this project. Uh, the, the, the smart city agency of Helsinki, the Forum Virium, was very uh, important in this. Uh, and I would say that there are uh, several interesting and fruitful ripple effects due to projects like this. And um, uh, last and not le least, it can be really fun to take part in, in a project like this. So I think I'll, I'll end my presentation there. P perhaps Erlu you could show just uh, the, the last picture uh, telling us about, uh, yeah, uh, the fabulous project in a nutshell. So while showing this last uh, um, part of the presentation, I'm ready to, uh, uh, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Fuda. Uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, so uh, uh, we're open again for uh, questions from uh, the audience. And uh, uh, while you think about your questions, uh, I might ask, so how did you get to be part of this uh, network? How, how did you find them or did they find you or how, how did you then get involved in this? Well, uh, it started uh, for us uh, with us wanting and trying to find international partners. Uh, we, when we discovered that we were planning, we were doing city planning uh, in accordance to yeah the the smart city planning schemes, we were looking for partners internationally, uh, and we uh, participated in several workshops, but both in Oslo, in Stavanger, and uh, and in Brussels. So uh, in the end of this, uh, the important partners Helsinki and Tallinn discovered us, 
and found, yeah, we, it could be interesting to have a small municipality outside EU and in Norway, and we were invited uh, uh, in. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you find the process uh, as a small municipality of applying for Horizon 2020 funding? Uh, you know, it has been in, 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 in parts of this uh, um, fairly complicated uh, for uh, uh, yeah a relatively small organization as as Yestal but we've we've learned a lot and as I as I said it has educated the whole organizations and the three four people working closely with this uh, are eager to to um, to go further and, and, and find new ways of co cooperating internationally. Yeah. And I mean, is this something, the international collaboration that you have here and also with big capital cities, is it something that you find is, uh, is it a relevant network? Do you have kind of experiences to share with these uh, cities? Yeah, you know, I, I've experienced uh, in, in some, you know, in some uh, situations, you don't want to tell people that you are uh, as small as we are, but, but uh, we have discovered that, uh, um, you know, Tallinn and Helmond and, and Helsinki, bigger cities, uh, they find it interesting to, uh, to cooperate with. Uh, we are small, but, but competent. So, of course, we, we can't choose a lot of projects, but we are currently discussing with our partners uh, um, to, uh, yeah, uh, continue and, and look for similar projects where we could... Um, uh, yeah, continue this uh, marvelous cooperation. Yeah, and I mean, this being part of a European project, is it something that also kind of helps you uh, nationally in terms of visibility or prestige or uh, some kind of your position within uh, the region or the country? At least on a regional level, uh, uh, the, the, the town center of Olga has for, I think for lots of uh, uh, inhabitants in Stavanga, it has been regarded as a fairly dull uh, uh, munis municipal centre. Uh, in the way we have been transforming our town centre and, uh, well, the first municipality trying robot cars on the level has, yeah, it, it, we've been showing ourselves, uh, it has given us uh, esteem and prestige in a way. And we find that even internationally, quite a lot of, 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 of uh, municipalities and, and companies that have heard of, yeah, the little municipality that sort of dares to, to be a part of this. So that would be my advice. Don't be, don't be afraid to try to, um, uh, to cooperate with bigger partners. There's, there's lots of things to learn for a small organization or small municipality and uh, we can um, uh, we can bring something to the table as well. Thank you. Uh, we have a question also from Bernadette, so uh, you can uh, turn on your your video and also ask a question. Yeah. So uh, you just mentioned uh, all the benefits, which is all very positive and useful for others to hear. But what I often hear from municipalities is that they have difficulties to find staff. So how did you create staff availability for, for your project? And what would you give them as an advice when, uh, for instance, they have to speak to a mayor, what should they say to create staff availability as, a, as an argument? Thank you. Uh, good questions. Um... We have not, uh, uh, we have used people already working in the municipality uh, and sort of picked out or uh, persons really wanting to, to, to be a part of this. Uh, and they have been encouraged to, to do this and they have learned. So the motivation have come from, from, from inside. Uh, but uh, you know, in the, the local paper, when we started this and, and told about ambition to become a, a smart city, we were kind of ridiculed because how on earth 
should uh, uh, a town center not even being a city trying to be a smart city so then uh, i think a key issue is to choose important projects uh, the transformation of the town center was something we wanted to do smart or not smart this was important we really wanted to improve uh, uh, the town center so everything every smart ambition every smart project that was uh, uh, intertwined with this uh, was then relevant and wanted so that gave it extra speed so you need and and I think it's it's important to to choose to try to pick some projects or, or phases of it that where you can show some kind of success early in the project. And I think we've succeeded there. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we can now open uh, the floor uh, to uh, a discussion and, and questions uh, across all the three presentations. So uh, maybe I will ask uh, Stieg and Dr. also to uh, turn uh, their videos on and, and participate in in that discussion and, and we're open to any any questions that you might have for the whole panel. Uh, so uh, again, I, I think I, I can start the discussion a little bit. Uh, so what struck me is that all three of you have presented projects where there is a collaboration between different sectors. So uh, there are municipalities, but also companies involved. And in all cases, you have an idea for a project that you think is a good project, but where you also need others to finance it, to invest in it, so that there isn't some kind of joint financing. And of course, we, we know well in, uh, in innovation, uh, there's always this not invented here syndrome that uh, getting others to buy into your idea, uh, getting for a company in the municipality to buy into their idea or for a municipality getting companies to invest in uh, developing something for them can be challenging. So how do you find this collaboration with uh, across different sectors and, and getting support for your idea? And we can start maybe with uh, with Dr. Well, I, I found it actually quite easy. It's um, as long as you're open and, uh, and I want to learn from the, those actually you, you want to work with. I think that's the best start because when we, when, for instance, if we go to meet uh, with the municipality, we don't enter the meeting and say, hey guys, we have the monopoly of all the common sense and we know the answers. It's not the way it works. Uh, we have to be very humble and also to use both ears to actually listen to what they actually need and what they struggle with. And, and very often during these projects, we actually learn a lot. Uh, from them. It's, it's not like a one-way street here. It goes both ways. So I think if you, if you have that kind of uh, approach, I think it's much easier to collaborate and respect each other's uh, competence because the municipalities have competence that we, we don't have at all. And, and we have some competence on technology, perhaps, or innovation that they don't have so much of, but it's a combination that actually can make it work very well. And, um, and just one comment about the staff uh, issue that was mentioned before. Uh, at least for us as a business uh, going in Horizon 2020 projects, we have run two of them. Uh, it's, it's really, for us, it's a real luxury because it's so very well funded, getting 70% uh, risk, uh, taking 70% of the risk off of our projects is really, really massive for a private company and for public um, public organizations like YesStart, they get 100% funding. So I think then you can actually hire a new staff if you need to replace some people because you get funds for, for doing it. So I think it's it shouldn't be such a big, big issue, I think. Thank you. Uh, Steve? I'll, I'll just echo what Doug Finn just said. I think three words, it's, it's open, humble and competent. Uh, we are always aware that the different uh, companies and uh, and yeah all, all parts that we talk to in these kind of projects are experts in their areas so we should recognize that and uh, and we should sort of benefit from it instead of having our opinions uh, just sort of pushed through there so we we start off at one point and we tend to learn things along as we go by listening basically so i think that's uh, that's what Doug Finn put, put in on words, really good. Yeah, uh, uh, as I mentioned, this has been a, a tremendous learning process for our staff and for the municipality. 
uh, perhaps the most complicated thing has has been to to learn how complicated these EU systems and the bureaucratic corridors can be. Uh, but the engine, uh, the motivational engine has been that people working in our staff really uh, love being a part of this and uh, are motivated by the possibility of meeting people from other countries uh, and trying to do something across the, the national borders. So, th so that is, as I probably mentioned, you, you have to pick the, 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 right, the right guys to do these uh, projects. And uh, I mean, uh, do you think there is something uh, in particular about the way that we organize this in, in Norway or in the Nordic countries, uh, the type of financing schemes that we have or the type of uh, ways in which we, uh, we build projects uh, that, uh, that can be a, a takeaway for, uh, for others? And, uh, whoever wants to start. Oda? Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, that I can say so much about the financing uh, issues here, but I, I'll start with from a different point of view there, that uh, I, I think that we have learned uh, or in our culture, we are, we like to work on bureaucratic, we like to work open minded. And I think we have a culture of involving people from all levels of the organization, not it's not the CEO deciding everything and defining uh, things as 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 uh, were mentioned here uh, we try to meet this and 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 we want to be humble towards uh, other person's perspective that's that's uh, of key importance i think yeah i totally agree and i remember we have worked with yestal as well and, and then we met for the first at the top but it didn't take long time before we were actually sitting with the people so in the floor, so to see, who actually owned the, the different challenges and, and problems. And, and that is really, that's a really good way of, at least for us to, to, to enter a new project. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, there are, uh, are not really more questions coming in. So uh, I think maybe we'll uh, hand over now. Oh, sorry, here is, uh, is a question uh, uh, from Nariman Ozer. Do you want to ask your question? So, uh, I mean, yeah, sorry, there you go, please. If you turn on uh, your microphone. Yeah, he's muted. Okay, so uh, I mean the, the comment that, that comes in here in, in the chat is congratulations to Mr. Fjelsper who showed the simple wish and courage to participate in an innovative project to make citizens' lives easier and, and more efficient despite the EU bureaucratic corridors, as he describes it, and, and makes, made it happen. So is this something you find as a, uh, as a mayor that there is a lot of bureaucracy to navigate uh, to get uh, kind of your, the wishes of the public or, or of the, the elected politicians through? Uh, well, yeah, both yes and no. Uh, that was the first major challenge is as a mayor when I or as a politician when I started nine years ago that when you work on a political level on a municipal level uh, things do take a lot of time and and we <laughs> we tend to get impatient uh, then later on I, I've I've learned of course that uh, uh, these bureaucratic institutions are needed to to yeah to to, to see that um, um, uh, uh, the quality of all what we do and the planning and the result ends out well. And I've learned that Norway isn't as bureaucratic as I thought it was. Um, so yeah, that was um, uh, that was a politi typical political answer, I guess. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I think uh, we will now uh, move on uh, and uh, uh, sum up uh, the main uh, takeaways from from this panel. And uh, we are pleased to, to have uh, Bernadette to give us some uh, reflections on what we have, have learned from today. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to say First of all, that I'm truly impressed uh, with the statements of, uh, of the speakers just now, because um, it was very interesting that you all mentioned that you wanted to do something and that was the starting point. And then you are very grateful if you have funds. It's, it's another way of looking at things uh, than what we usually hear. You know, people often say, why don't we have funds for this so I can do it? But you said, Oh, I want to do all these things. And if I have funds, it's even better because I will have uh, stuff and uh, I can save money and so on. So this was a very interesting, I don't know if it appeared to others, but it was a very interesting way of looking at things <laughs> from another perspective. So I think I, I, we can definitely encourage everybody to take away that with, the, with them today, that think about all the things you want to do first and then look for how you are going to do it in terms of uh, funding or financing. And that's, uh, that's one takeaway that I wanted to highlight. The second thing um, that I really felt was very impressive is the, the collaboration aspect. And you of course highlighted the openness and how you create uh, flat structures and uh, how you build that up. But even um, for external eyes, I think today you have uh, really showed that it doesn't start with a project. It's like a mix of things that have to be there and uh, it takes uh, a lot of time, uh, but it's worth building up this uh, kind of collaborations. Uh, in Prospect, we talk a lot about um, legal barriers also in procurement and it was really impressive to hear that you were highlighting how pre-commercial procurement can help and how being small but smart uh, is uh, very important and uh, having a good competent uh, procurer. So I think that sitting on a um, um, bright way in this kind of uh, subject is very important. So not just highlighting why procurement is difficult, but how can we find solutions. So the solution mindedness came through definitely. I would also like to, to mention that uh, dealing with time was another aspect that I heard today. Uh, we often want things uh, being done very quick. This is, uh, this is something that we are learning all, I think in this year, especially how things can slow down and how we have to manage long-term thinking, long-term projects. And I heard today how you had actually patience for this and how you build up those collaborations. So I would like really to congratulate for this attitude of thinking long-term, waiting for small pieces to come together, but um, being resilient and do things and look at the learning potential. And what I would also like to highlight, because all these things uh, reflect also what I heard from other participants in, in the project, that, um, I'm really impressed that we had a mayor today taking time in a, you know, a busy, busy period uh, we, and show how political commitment and uh, pride and uh, openness and uh, eager to learn things actually can move us forward. So today I think a lot of municipalities listen and this video is, uh, I mean, this webinar is recorded and I think you truly are an example for many uh, people who have participated in the project and said, oh, it's so difficult to convince the politicians. It's very difficult to get them on board. It's not easy to, to find uh, ways of working uh, together. And you really, um, uh, from Hiestal, show that a small municipality with a good leadership can deliver results and uh, can dream big. Uh, so I would really like to thank to all of you today for presenting how you collaborated in different projects. And uh, I would like to have a special thank you for um, 
being here as speakers and to Runa and Edel for creating the conditions for this. I have heard a lot of new things, even myself, even if I'm quite familiar with what's happening in, in Stavanger in, and in Norway. So a lot of new elements and I'm pretty sure that many of the participants heard uh, interesting things and takeaways more than what I could summarize in a, such a short period of time. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, so thank, thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. See you guys. Thank you. Bye.